complying with public research policy. Okay. Oh, it's for you. It's for me. Let's see if that works. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Somewhere. working. What does this do? Nothing. Does it have a... No, never mind. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi there. My name is Vic Cornell. I'm from Data Direct Networks. Um, and really, Data Direct Networks are... We've been sponsors of this um, this meeting for quite a while and we've been involved with iRODs um, and we're really starting to see some traction with iRODs amongst our customers and what I wanted to talk about today was uh, some of the drivers that our customers are seeing and some of the proposals that we've got for uh, using iRODs so that they can fulfill those drivers that they're seeing from their research councils. Um, I was given the title of the talk so I may wander off by my boss who was supposed to be giving it. So I may wander away a little bit from time to time. How do I get this to point? Is this the pointer? Uh, yes. Oh, it's way. Yeah, I haven't, I've got a different laptop, so I'll do it with this. Okay. So what I wanted to go over was um, a little bit of an overview of the kind of compliance re requests and uh, compliance requirements that a lot of the research council people in the UK are seeing. I uh, just wanted to talk about one of the one of our customers that we're working with just to show you uh, what they're seeing, what their requirements are, um, the architecture, storage architecture that they've installed and how uh, we and they are looking to integrate that with iRODs. Um, just to talk about some of the iRODs capabilities that they think may help them um, how they might implement iRODs with their workflows, and then some of the challenges and the unknowns that we're seeing from them. So EPSRC is one of the, um, is one of the research councils in the UK, and as you can see, they're starting to put conditions on uh, grant proposals such that they have to make sure that the metadata for the, data, for the research data that, they, that people produce and they acquire are published and they put some timescales on them so they have to be made freely available over the internet. Also, if they fund the research, they have to preserve the data for a minimum of 10 years. And uh, there's another research council which is the MRC, the Medical Research Council. They're a bit less stringent. They basically require that all, I think this is similar to the US situation, where everybody has to have a data management plan. I think that's been the case up to now, but what's happened is they've actually started looking at them and asking questions like, how are you going to do this? How you've got a data management plan? How are you going to implement this? Because people are going to be expected to adhere to the data management plan and people will be looking for results. So that's put quite a, a strain on uh, some of the departments. At the moment, we're working with uh, Imperial College, have a bioinformatics support service. Um, I'm not a bioinformatician. I was a marine biologist a long time ago. Um, so if I use some words, I'm only cargo culting them sometimes. I don't really know what they mean. But they, they're part of the Center for Integrative Systems Biology and Bioinformatics. I think I know what bioinformatics are. Not so sure about the other thing. Um, and this is a group who do a lot of the work in bioinformatics, but they also support, educate, and provide systems for the scientists who are doing bioinformatics research. And they do it in a, a massive range of applications. So they, a large number of studies, so they basically they do lots and lots of different things, everything from genomes from people from Chernobyl to Strange, or strange animals. It's a very, very wide uh, research. They get data from their own internal equipment. 
the next generation sequences, we know that these are coming in and producing enormous amounts of data. Uh, very high resolution microscopes. And this is just to say, this is even what DDN called big data. So one of their phenome studies produces seven gigabytes every 15 minutes. And it does that for about two weeks a month, every 12 months a year. So they're just that one study is producing half a petabyte a year. And of course, that's all produced with research council money, which means that they have to keep it for 10 years, and they have to publish the research, the metadata, so that people can get at it. They also have to take uh, data sets from other research institutes, and they use those as part of their uh, processing. One of the biggest things we see from them is staffing. They're incredibly busy. We <laughs> We installed a system for them, and they still haven't played with it very much because they're too busy trying to overcome all the IT challenges they've got to keep the system that they're replacing this with this going. Uh, they're trying to recruit more staff, but it's a specialist area. So this is what, they, uh, this is what they've installed. They've got two sites, basically for disaster recovery and replication. Uh, they've got some block storage on both sites. One's a bit bigger than the other. These are object store systems. So there's about, well, whatever, 840 times uh, four is. It's a lot of several, I think it's five petabytes of uh, object storage. They've got a tape library, which they use with TSM. And the underlying file system is GPFS. GDN style is grid scalar, but it's GPFS from our friends at IBM. I know this one here. Um, and this thing was bridge, allows them to keep the metadata for the files, the directory entry, the stubs, the modification time, that kind of stuff in the GPFS namespace, but to move the actual data into the object store. And that's because an object store is an easier thing to scale than a parallel file system, generally speaking. So that's what they've bought. Now, prepare yourself. This is what it looks like in my head. <laughs> so we've got three tiers of storage. Tier one, tier two, tier three. First tier is a general GPFS file system. Uh, lots of disks, so you get lots of speed. Back end is InfiniBand nice, straightforward POSIX file system for people to use for processing. And that'll be attached to one or more clusters. Tier two is back-ended by the object store. There is, a, there is an IRODS bit coming, by the way, for those of you who are thinking. <laughs> this is uh, object store connected via WAS bridge to a little GPFS cache. Client nodes right to a little file system that gets tiered off to this was object store, which is replicated across the two sites. That's what these are. And then a third one, another little GPFS cache, goes via the TSM service off to tape. So they have a broad spectrum of storage solutions available to them to help with their science. But it's complicated. And people are going to want to know which one they should use for what and how. So what we're proposing at the moment is that eventually they carry on using tier one, just like everybody uses their scratch system. Tier one's nice and simple file, file system. And then we put an iRODS service in front of tiers two and three. That means that these storage in these systems are controlled by iRODS. iRODS is able to do the work of managing the storage, managing metadata, managing retrieval, all the hard stuff that they need to do with the data which is important to them. And they can bring it out into this system and work with it. And that's basically, the, oh, that's clever. Don't do that. <coughs> so an example workflow, again, really? Very simple, um, just from my layman's point of view, you get your data off a sequencer, you, look, you put it into tier two, because tier two is where you put things that you care about, and the, the sequencer is 
kind of ground truth or sea truth, we used to call it in oceanography. So you want to keep that. You want to make it immutable because you don't want it to change. You register the data with IRODs. This bit's <coughs> up for discussion as to whether or not we put it in the tier two and then register it with IRODs or we use IRODs to I put it. There's kind of pros and cons there. We associate metadata from the sequencer that's, used, that's produced during the production. We add in data from the LIMS, the laboratory management system, if that exists. And then using IRODs, we publish the data via an AIMS. I've never seen one of these. I can't find one, but apparently they exist. Academic information management systems. Or maybe they're more of a kind of wish thing. I'm not sure. But that's the general workflow which we're looking at implementing. So, why IRODs? Well, all this bit, I think we've all heard most of the good things about IRODs, what IRODs does. So this bit's probably for people who don't really know what IRODs does. It's a rules-based engine. Uh, we know that it does time-based policies, so that helps us manage some of our compliance issues. After 10 years, maybe you can make the data not immutable but it gives you the opportunity to make those rules. Um, it's got a complex rule system, so it can manage all the corner cases. So it's, it's a good uh, system. Well, it's a good candidate to use for this kind of work. Um, the policy enforcement points, at various points in the workflows that are created, we can use these policy enforcement points to do processing, to do metadata harvesting, to do tagging, all the kinds of stuff that they want to do in order to keep the data, curate the data, make the metadata available, and make the data safer as long as it needs to be. Little, little DDN-y sort of thing. You still have to have resilient storage underneath, in our view, in order to make it a nice, stable pile. These are the, some, some of the questions I came with. So. How immutable is immutable? So I've been looking at the permissions. You can, you can take away the permission to write to an, to an IRODS object, but is that immutable enough? Do we want IRODS to tell the underlying storage to make storage immutable? How, how immutable is immutable? How much do you care about your data? Some of this data costs a lot. Um, this is a kind of, this is a, an ambition really. Can we integrate with a LIMS? for not just sequencing data, but for other data, to do end-to-end -end data harvesting. Can we kind of cradle to grave a piece of data using IRODs and integrate it with the other systems inside the lab so that we can have an end-to-end -end chain of custody, chain of provenance, so that when you have that piece of data, when somebody downloads it from the web, they know exactly where it came from, how it was made, how it was processed, what data sets were used to process it with, all that kind of good stuff. This is more of my what, where's this aims? Which one should we integrate with? Is the one that's going to work well with IRODs? Does anybody know? Scaling. So at the moment, this is a seven petabyte. I did write petabyte. This is a seven petabyte facility. It's likely to grow significantly over the next five years. How can we get all that into one IROD zone? We're going to have file counts to scale with seven petabytes. How much data can we put into one IRODS ICAP? Will we need to federate? If we need to federate, how will it work? Will it work, will it work well? Will it be seamless? That kind of thing. And my other little niggle, databases. Data, I used to work for a company that had a thousand databases. Databases are really hard. And they're hard to make them run quickly. So. I'm a bit worried about putting all my, well, not my eggs, Imperial College's eggs in a database without having significant resources to manage and feed that database. So I think I'm just on the, look at that, five minutes for questions. <laughs> Any questions that I know how to answer? Yes, sir. So this is my ignorance. What, what's the issue with end establish, you know, harvesting end-to-end -end, uh, it's, it, provenance it's and, and how, chain of custody? What's uh, the problem? 
There's no, there's no essential problem except that you've got lots of different systems to integrate with. So at some point, maybe there are going to be different paths through which the metadata arrive. So but you might have... But if it's in the metadata chain, it should be there. So it's just really an IT problem of can we read metadata of this type? Can we get it from this source? Can we, can we take it out of the files? It's, it's just it's a really lovely thing to have. Is it going to be feasible? And I don't know the answer. It might be yes. How is the metadata organized and used right now, comparatively? I think a lot of it's in files. So this is, this is, as I understand it, bear in mind I'm a marine biologist, this is uh, sort of standard genomics type stuff. So there are SAM files and BAM files. So some of the metadata is, is in the files, I understand. There are indexes, which are part of the files, and then there are external indexes. And I think lots of stuff gets written down, Excel spreadsheets. I mean, it's probably going to be, for as many workflows as they have, they've probably got as many different metadata storage management methods. Yeah, in a sense, I think probably one way of doing it is with AVU, which we saw before, um, which mm. IART support natively but are going beyond that and using something like Elasticsearch. Um, what was the last thing? Elasticsearch or that's Apple Store or that's, something like that. That's the second time I've heard of Elasticsearch today. Okay. Yeah, that might be one way of in the In the context of doing this sort of thing. Okay. Thank you. Ah. Seems like we have the same three <laughs> question people all the time. So under immutability, you described um, uh, setting, the, uh, s setting the storage bits to be immutable rather than the IROD's bits. Right? Yeah. Is that, is that a thing? I mean, uh, C-H-A-T-T-R minus I at a file system level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, uh, there's, a, there's, a re there's a write only was. You could do a storage pool. You could do we, a can do a, we can do a, we can do a, a I'm pretty sure Dave isn't shaking his head. So I think we can make was write only. Yeah. Or we can have a policy in was which you can put things in, but you can't take them out again. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the question. You know, does it have to be where's EMC? Solera's, they're pretty good at immutability. Was has got immutability. But do we need to do it at a hardware level or do we trust IROBs? Yeah. That was that, the question. That's gonna be something you learn on the go and yeah. kind of see. Yeah. We don't want to learn it the hard way though. <laughs> Come and see us. Is your, so is your ultimate plan with the IROD's implementation to uh, uh, do all of your metadata, metadata harvesting into the IROD's system itself, or are you going to have a separate auxiliary metadata database in addition to that? Well, uh, somewhere in there, I think I've got sustainability. I made a big list of things that I was worried about, databases. Database stability, availability, and recoverability. So one of my big issues with this sort of thing is IRODS gives you one big namespace, yeah? So if your one big namespace goes up in a puff of smoke, especially if you've got all your data on, a, on an object store or you've got it in random directories on a file system, it's not good. So you really want to take some of that data, maybe some of the metadata, and put it in a different namespace. Now, it might be a federated IRODS, or it might be something completely different. But it's, that's something that I think, it, it, in sort of commercial talk, it's, it's the customer's uh, attitude to risk, is what we usually say. We say to the customer, what's your attitude to risk? How much do you want to, how much resource do you want to put into uh, mitigating the risk of losing this stuff? Is that what you were asking? No, I'm, I'm talking about IROD's type metadata. So, you know, what the, what the firmware on the sequencer was, that sort of metadata. Uh, 
I think, I think uh, Imperial College have got lots of different databases, lots of them, which they use to keep metadata for some of this stuff on. Okay. Thanks. That's, that, that's helped. I think that's me. Yeah.